Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller, an African-American, licensed psychotherapist, professor, diversity coach, consultant, and author. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias, anything that marginalizes and oppresses. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, we'll have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? Dr. Jin's in the house. Thank you, Welcome. Thank you. thank you for having me. It is a pleasure. It is a pleasure to meet you. And thank you for not making me stalk you and beg. I'd like to save some of my uh, pride and keep it intact. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. I wouldn't want you to do that. Thank you. And anyway, I'm just kidding because I have no shame. I, if I want to have you on, I'm going to make it happen. So thank you so My much again. I appreciate here. it. Thank you for the work you do in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have a lot to cover. So I want to get started. But first thing, I just want to check in and see how you are. You've been on a whirlwind. Thank so how are you asking. doing? Yeah, I am um, feeling deeply grateful, full, and always feeling like I'm teetering on the edge between like wired and tired. <laughs> <laughs> keeping it real right i'm always on that edge between am i doing too much and there's a lot coursing through me and i have a lot of ideas and like ripping and running so, yeah and just really deeply feeling i think as we were touching base upon earlier just a bit feeling like the world's intensity right yeah. as a fellow mm -hmm. feeler i feel that i know what you're talking about so next, just a little bit about you. Where are you from and how can you best sum up your childhood through adolescent experience? <laughs> Go. Wait, how long do I have? A minute? <laughs> uh, okay. So I was raised in Jersey City, New Jersey, not to be confused with South Jersey. We don't represent them. <laughs> I'm just kind of kidding, but I'm not. Um, uh, yeah, we're the ones that are like a 15 minute train ride to New York City. So we're kind of like the Jersey New Yorkers. Um, if you cannot hear it from my accent. Bridge and tunnel people through and through, through and through. And so, yeah, I grew up, I would say my parents are probably working poor, right? Working class, somewhere around there. I grew up in the inner city and I grew up with two parents. Um, I... Let me see, what can I tell? Oh my gosh, there's so much. I can sum up my childhood by saying that I was intense as a child. I felt a lot. I saw a lot and I talked a lot. No, no surprise there. Yeah. And um, my mom is black Panamanian and indigenous, Kuna and Mayan Indian. And my dad is Irish and Italian. Um, my dad grew up also in the inner city of New Jersey. Um, and so... We kind of lived there until I went away for school. Well, I went to NYU while I was working full time at a partial care unit in Newark, New Jersey. Um, I went to NJCU as an undergrad student, and that was also an inner city university. And what I can tell you about Jen growing up is that I had a lot of rage, you know, and I wasn't really feeling it. And I got in trouble a lot. And I was also, a, you know, a straight A student. I love school, you know, so I was out there ripping and running as much as my mother would not allow it. And at the same time, I just found a lot of sanctuary in English and writing and like learning. I always loved learning and I was, I was told that I was a sponge, but that I would never shut up. And I would, I would, I would never stay in my seat either. Um, I was a bit of a fighter. I was a bit intense in that way. Um, and I will also tell you that, you know, I grew up with, a lot of our like Panamanian and black and Latinx culture. Like it was just sort of part of how we were raised, how we understood the world, how I was supposed to act in this world, quote unquote. And I think that part of my identity also was being highly sensitive and like not diagnosed with ADHD, you know? And so like it, it took into adulthood to really figure out what that meant and that my brain worked a little bit different and how that might have been related to trauma as well. Are you telling my story or yours? <laughs> yes, many of our stories, okay, okay. 
I mean, that intensity, man, that is something at a young age to try to try to manage. Yes. That, that's a lot. It's a lot, yes. of, a lot of big feelings and little bodies. That, so yes. I can relate to that. However, I was not a straight A student. So that's when you <laughs> stop my story. <laughs> Dan, yours. I'm going to uh, skip to something that happened to you in college because I have a feeling that had a little something to do with you shaking shit up. And that's when uh, when a professor told you that, let me see, let me try to get this right. You articulate well, but once in a while, a little boys in the hood voice comes out. Is that when yes. you decided to change the narrative? Talk to me this. about that. And I was like, wait, where did you hear this? I was like, where did I say this? I said, I probably said it more than one place. Um, yeah, let me tell you, um, that man, I don't, I don't know if, if you can identify, but so sometimes how it shows up in my body when somebody says something super ignorant like that, right? Um, a, there's a part of me that's like, I'm going to show you. There's another part of me that wants to like knock them out. There's another part of me that wants to hide and shut down, especially when you're in a place. Um, I, I was at NYU, believe it or not, for my master's, my grad, this was grad study, right? And we were full time in two years. So meaning like on the weekend, I was going to school, getting my master's. And during the week, I was working at a partial care unit with extreme trauma, like extreme trauma, all black and brown youth. Um, and so here this man, I guess, <laughs> so to answer your question, it was definitely one of the ticking me over the edges because like none of my classmates responded to it. Everybody shut down. I shut down in the moment. Um, this was a queer white man saying this in front of the whole class to me. So there's multiple layers there right i'm trying not to make a face Go ahead. um and but i was able to tell him about himself after i got my a in that class i did go into his office and let him know that what he said was uncalled for and that he had some learning to do and that um i gave him some examples in, in ways that he could relate with his intersectional oppressed identities and how that landed in my body and how i'll never forget it you know, and that I told him that some of the ways in which I was raised and how I walk through this world are important for other youth and people that I work with to see it, to feel it, and to understand that they're not alone and that they could do stuff with themselves too. Even being first generation college student, growing up in the inner city, lots of incarcerated family members or dead family members due to systems and structures as that be. Um, oh yeah, that really, yeah, that was part of it. But I think, you know, my mom would say that I came out of the womb saying no <laughs> and saying not today. <laughs> now, how did you receive that information from you? Um, the, the professor? Yeah. Um, I don't think he fully received it. I think he probably was out of his body in the moment because it was a lot of giving me back like stereotypical therapist, like Mm, mm, I'm sorry you feel like that. And then I would say, well, this is more than just how I feel. You know, you're enacting harm on me. This is a microaggression, you know, and this is probably before microaggressions were really talked about or people were understanding micro macroaggressions. And he was like, well, you're really lucky to be here. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's all you're talking about. <laughs> no, you see, it's the other way around. You're lucky I'm here. Um, and I might not have said it so smoothly at the time, you know, I think I was way more rough around the edges. And I think moving to California and the Bay Area chilled me out considerably. It gave me a little bit of a, believe it or not, yeah, chilled me out and allowed me to see people's humanity, even in the imperfection of their humanity, right? Even if they were harming me, doesn't mean I would allow it, but living in the Bay Area and doing some really deep inner work on myself and doing rage work, um, with Ruth King and others allowed me to reframe and restructure how I allowed whiteness to see me, right? And how I allowed um, that gaze or that view to impact me and my spirit. I, I hear you and I appreciate that and I value your perspective. I, I also get pissed off uh, because this idea that, you know, you're in the community and and you misuse your, you know, oppressed i don't even like saying oppressed but you you know the times that you've been marginalized you misuse that and and place that harm on someone else that's why i don't like microaggressions anymore it's like yeah. no the cut yeah. is a cut is a cut yeah. yeah that man when i read that when i i don't know if i heard it or read it but i was like oh no hell no 
I had a whole visceral response to it. So thank you for sharing your journey with that. I appreciate it. Raising it and mentioning it. Yeah. It clearly it stayed with me, you know, like clearly throughout all the years, I just kept looking back every so often on it and thinking, I never want to do that. I never want to like provide that or be that impact of harm on a student, especially if let's say I don't have that experience or that identity. I want to be really conscious of how I come across. And to be honest with you, it was also another impetuous of like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this work for the people. (laughs) (laughs) A legacy. You have to leave a legacy. Right. I feel you. So then what was the catalyst for the development of your new book, Decolonizing Therapy, Oppression, Historical Trauma, and Politicizing Your Practice? Yes. Thank you for asking. Um, I would say... Everything we just talked about is definitely part of that, right? Like I, I don't throw away any angle of like my experience. Um, I would also say being, and I, I'm sure you and many people listening can identify, being in classrooms and places and spaces where a lot of my identities were consistently othered, right? Where my blackness was othered, where we're looked at as like percentages. Like for an example, I remember being in a grad class, a doctoral grad grad class and someone who will remain nameless, that was a professor, (laughs) because I'll be happy to name it, but I don't want them to come for whatever little bit I have, okay? I, I like I like a name drop, you know. That, that's not this that. individual was like, "Well, I was in the Harvard Review, and I have presented, and da, da da And my only question is, why are we reading an article from 1970 something that he wrote or co-authored that explicitly and clearly states that black fathers are less equipped to handle fatherhood and parenting than their white counterparts? And there is no context given. I'm a grad student, bro. Why am I doing your job for you? Right? Like, why am I like, I'm sorry. What's the, why are we learning about this? Like, do you want, there's some questions you wanted. You want us to connect it to a new article. Like I'm over here. Like there gotta be a reason, right? <laughs> there's gotta be, feed me something because I'm going to come. Right. And a number of us were a little bit out of sorts and this kind of grew. And then this became a bigger thing. And so my program got called to task by larger structures that would give them accreditation um, because also we were not learning in our family systems class about queer families, about blended families. Meanwhile, we're in the middle of the Castro district in San Francisco and we're in the mission. We're not learning about immigrants, migration, trauma. You know, we're all sitting here like this is not a full education, right? Like if you can't provide access or you can't provide professors that are doing this work or even community members, give us give us rounds, you know, community members doing this work that are indigenous identified, that are Latinx identified, that are, you know, if you can't do this, then this is not adequate. And so um, I think part of that was being a New Yorker, New Jersey. I, <laughs> part of it was knowing that I was going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for a subpar education, okay? And another part of it was also, as we do, practically working for free as interns, right? Or externs or practicum students. And I'm working with youth and families that have all this intense trauma, that are barely making ends meet, that are living with massive amounts of historical and intergenerational trauma, right? That are blaming their children or themselves. And meanwhile, there are total systems and structures at play that have a hand in poisoning the water that they're drinking, literally and figuratively and emotionally and spiritually. And um, frankly, I couldn't go in every day engaging with these families in good conscience. You know, I'm introducing myself to these communities that I'm not from because I wasn't from the Bay Area, right? So I'm going to block parties. I'm showing up to hear Tony, Tony, Tone do a re, a redo, or a, you know, a yearly whatever in, in Oakland. Like I'm showing up to events, to the, the schools, because I want the families to know that I'm trying, that I'm connecting. I know I'm not from here. You all know I'm from New York and Jersey, but 
I'm doing my best to understand Bay Area culture. Show me how to go dumb. Show me what, right? Like, <laughs> what are we doing? We go right in the way. What are we doing? Right? Like it's a whole other culture for me because it's a different energy. So that's part of it. And I would say the other part is when I went back to the East Coast, I was invited back to the university that I graduated from undergrad and JCU. And I taught there for 13 years, but I was part of their counseling center and I facilitated a peer education group that saved my life when I was 18, 19 years old. And this PEP program, um, I was able to have retreats, like take students that were younger versions of me <laughs> thinking, I don't even need to be in school. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know if I'm going to graduate. I don't know if I'm going to stay alive by the end of this. Um, and I would bring them a with their permission, of course. And we were doing a lot of work in advance. They were in their own therapy in a counseling center or elsewhere. And we would go on these retreats. And these retreats probably are where DT, decolonizing therapy, started because, you know, we're, I'm bringing in like a somatic therapist, a play therapist. We're doing psychodrama. You know, we're doing rage retreats. I had a retreat called, um, and I got to be creative, right? Denialina River in Wakanda. <laughs> I'm just, you know, and then we, we we kind of created this like it was all like so pro black and pro beautiful, and also let's look at some of our history and some of our pains. Just for this weekend, we're not going to stay stuck here. We're not going to let it drown us. But let's look at this. Let's see how it's connected to how our parents and grandparents raised us. Let's look at how they're raising us benefited us and impacted us negatively. And let's look at what are some of these um, methods, behaviors, patterns, and belief systems that we've come to believe are culture, but perhaps they're not, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple of things are coming up. One is that, you know, this idea of brown and black bodies and, and bodies of culture, how we do therapy long before uh, we knew that we were decolonizing. Yeah. We were decolonizing, you know, yeah. because we were working through a collective lens. And so, and it was instinctive, you yeah. know. There, yeah. there, I always say, I'd like to say I'm sorry to all the people whose license I was on because I did it my way and not yours um, because it had to be done. You know, you're working in the community. And so you had to make it your own. You had to make it make sense. Yes. And so I read, you know, what you're saying resonates with me so much. And I completely understand how that began your journey of really starting to understand you know, that decolonization is necessary. And then Nothing. you name it and you put it in a package and now you're running with it. And so <laughs> congratulations you. to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And you know, I, I would be remiss if I also didn't say that I think part of it is like also, you know, I feel like our lineages, no matter our, it, is, it doesn't necessarily have to connect with, with religion or spirituality, but I feel like in me or I was put on this earth, right? And I, I suppose many people have these feelings in different ways for different reasons, to make sure also that like our lineages and our ancestors are honored and called for the work that they've been doing with so little, you know, and, and the ways that they had to hide things in the back, right? And the ways in which like our, all of our, especially women and femmes, like, like how many black women and femmes labor, emotional labor has not been acknowledged throughout the years and how we see that in our mind, body, and spirits and how it affects us. I don't think burnout is just a present day issue. I think it's a historical lineage issue, you know? And like, what is it like to constantly care for other people's children and have your own removed or have your own put to work on a field or your own in another country and you have to come here and work for another family, right? It just yeah absolutely and and you know i've been reading a lot about epigenetics i mean you know that's a whole other show but i'm just saying it's all so connected to the lineage yeah. and so how you know the eurocentric lens just denies all of that and so it's so important that i love that bodies of culture are bringing this out we're no longer hiding in the back with the work that we do that's related to this it's so important you said i'm gonna go to a quote you said you said for too long, the goal of therapy has been to help people adapt to oppression and cope with ongoing trauma of colonial capitalist and white supremacist systems. How do you propose the revolution progress? Yeah. Um, well, number one, I think that part of this process is the work that we're still doing on ourselves to unravel this 
I'm going to use a heavy word right now on purpose, this noose that is um, culturally and collectively around a lot of us. And many of us have woken up, whatever that means, right? Many of us are still including myself in the process of awakening. I don't know if I'm ever going to be done, right? And, and many of us are still like, I was going to get this money and I'll be good. You feel me? Right. And, and sometimes that black and brown excellence talk, although important in its own way and education and all that, but I feel that there's so many of us that still are not on the, on the same pages together. Right. We're still not using the same, not about the language, same energy, same movement forward. And so I think one of the first steps is like unraveling and decolonizing emotionally everything that we have learned throughout our lives, you know, unless we've had educators, therapists like yourself and others that have shown us that light, that we don't always have to see ourselves through that Eurocentric, very Western, very white is right lens. And I do believe that that takes time because we, we, we move forward and then sometimes, we, oh, snap, like I'm doing it or, you know, we judge somebody on something or we, you know, so I do believe it is a work in progress and we do need community and compassion with one another and to call each other out sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I remember when I, when I uh, started teaching adjunct and I think about years ago, how I, how I taught and, and look forward to today. And, you know, I, I walk in the class and say, you know, I'm teaching through my mm. blackness. Let's mm. just put that out there mm. because mm. your white professors and professors mm. from other cultures are doing the same thing. Mm. They're just not naming it. Mm. So I'm, I'm going to name that right here. So we know where we're starting. And man, you know, it lands well with some people and with most people, some people it doesn't because, you know, like the nerve of me to call out what's in the room and, and, you know, feeling that empowerment to do that for ourselves is a part of yes decolonizing ourselves yes. it's claiming it you yeah. know in a way that it makes sense to us and it doesn't always have yes. to make sense to that. other people i love that yes and and um, you know what i'm thinking of i'm just adding to what you're saying because i'm thinking also of all the students that also like how many times i got complaints you know why they didn't make me a full professor even when i was hella close to the chair she loved what i was doing i don't know if you can ever you know and I, when there was an open position and i was trying to move from the counseling center because the constant one-to-one -one work and the trauma was really after 10 years was starting to wear on my soul i had to go into the hospital for dehydration i was drinking a gallon of water a day going to acupuncture working out it was the energy right like i was, I was like holding too much it was too much 10 students a day through my lunch crisis, you name it. And I remember the chair and other people who I think were well-intentioned were like, well, we need you to have more research experience. Right. And I was like, but these students, like, look at my, like, wait, <laughs> here's what they, they want me. They don't understand why I'm not teaching more classes. This is not from me. This is, here's my, my feedback forms. Right. And yeah, but so-and-so came to us crying. Okay, that was one student that was starting to look at their behavior, starting to look at their whiteness, starting to look at, that's not unhealthy. I wasn't screaming at her in class in her face. Like <laughs> She had feelings. She needs to process those feelings before she works in our communities. Right? You know, and um, yeah, and I just remember them saying, yeah, yeah, okay, apply. And then they didn't even interview me. And I think also thinking about those structures and systems right? And those blocks of who's allowed in, that gatekeeping, even into the ivory tower is real. Is real. Absolutely. Even, especially, 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 you know, I mean, I, I think about, you know, when I was uh, teaching in the LGBTQIA uh, section, and because I centered my blackness, mm. I was anti-gay. Mm. And I said, wow, that's right. some shit right there. <laughs> <laughs> because I centered my blackness and difference of opinions and perspectives within the community, I was anti-trans, anti-gay. I was wow. like, that is so messed up, man. Wow. Like, how does like that it. happen? So we have to call out white-bodiedness for what it is because yeah. it sets a precedent again and again and again for when we are re-marginalized, re-traumatized and not given what you deserve. And that's a perfect example of what yeah, you shared. No, thank, thank you for you. sharing that. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm also thinking, I remember a student, um, he was 
gay, white identified, cisgendered identified. And um, he was like, listen, I just don't understand why black women feel, said this out loud in class. I'm really curious and I don't understand why black women feel that we're stealing their vernacular and like stealing their, <laughs> and, and you know, I had to have like several seats with myself and think about how I wanted to approach the, because there's so many layers. There's people watching, there's students, there's there's so many layers. There were so many layers. And I just kept thinking to myself, there's so much more education, right? And um, I just kept reminding him that his queerness does not dissolve him or devoid him or whatever the case is of, of being racist as well, right? Or... Um, and then the other piece that he's like, yeah, 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 but, but, and kept pushing and kept pushing. And I thought, even in our exchange, would you push a white male therapist in the way that you're pushing me, questioning me, and in some ways disrespecting me, you know? So I would see that and I would frequently ask my students, where does whiteness show up in your casework? Where does whiteness show up in your therapy room? Even if no one in the room is white identified, right? Where do the systems, the threads, the structures, the the spirit of white bodied supremacy show up in what you're doing. And that's what I'd be like. I feel like that's one of the first areas that needs tackling. Um, I also just want to say in terms of like the movement forward and the decolonial work, it's like, I really do believe it's a revitalization and like honoring that half of these theories that we're learning in our schools, you know, for therapy, psychology, social work, um, they're showing us white, I'm assuming men identified. I didn't know how they, you know, they identified as cisgendered or not. I don't know how Freud rocks or whatever, but I could, I could see, you know, I see that he's, right? he seems to be a white male along with Bandura and Ellis and, you know, we can keep going, right? You know, Young, Charcot, and there's a sprinkling of white women in some of my learnings. And then it was a sprinkling further out from multicultural counseling and others of folks of color and Sue and Sue and what have you. Right. But we know, we know who they're going to, we know the books, we know the, right. And so part of me also like me writing this was for the me that was telling my students, I want you to download all these articles. Here's all the articles for free for da 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 This is on intersectionality. This is Kimberly Crenshaw. This is on this. This is on that. This is on Latin Latinidad and anti-blackness. This is on um, color complex and dark. Like, I feel like I had to put together a textbook that they didn't have. And so decolonizing therapy is really supposed to be a resource for a lot of therapeutic classrooms, you know, a lot of grad and undergrad classrooms so that we could start talking about how we also need to be learning about historical trauma. We need to be learning about suffocated and disenfranchised grief, right? We need to be learning about rage and how that's pathologized in black bodies and brown bodies, immigrant bodies, right? We need to be learning about, oh my gosh, so much. Microaggressions much more. We need to be learning about like structural oppression, lateral oppression. There's so many ways, right? We need to be learning about cis heteropatriarchy and like we need to learn about what it's like to live in late stage capitalism, have mental health issues and how they're both correlated, right? And how are we gonna help people and come up with new systems for psychiatric hospitalizations because it's violent. I'll tell you, you know, I do, uh, I teach at the uh, NCP in California. It's the Psychoanalytic Institute. And I teach a decolonizing therapy section. Um, and it's fascinating, you know, the depths of which you are speaking. It, it is so deep in the system of psychiatric care. And I do consulting with um, clinicians who, who desire to be more anti-Black racist in their, in their practice. And the stories I hear, it's just so unbelievable what is going on in these institutions. And then people carry it over into their private practice. I mean, you know, one of the things that I've always said is stop telling black and brown bodies they're safe in your office. Stop it. Just stop. Like, that's one of the first things I'll say. Don't tell me I'm safe because I'm not safe in you. And if you start that way, then you are a part of the problem. Yes. And like, it's those things that, uh, that make me so appreciative of what you're putting together here. I think it's so beneficial. Again, thank you for the work that you're doing and the illuminating. Because, 
you know, I always think and I say to myself, who's holding us? And, and I do believe that we have certain community, we have supervision groups, we have consulting groups, but that's always my concern too, right? Like when we're out there in these historically white institutions that have very um, one note agendas often, not always, but it's sort of like, here's the one class, you're going to teach this, whether it's a decolonial one, a multicultural one, we know we can keep changing the name of it. <laughs> Right, a DEI one, and no shade, no shade to those trying. And what are we doing in case in psychopathology 101? What are we doing in psychoanalytic theory? Da, da, da? What are we doing in CBT? What are we doing in somatic? Are we integrating the totality of us into all of this? And if you're like, well, I don't know about that, so I can't teach it, so then guess someone that can, honey, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the problem is like you give me a five week section and say, teach it all, knowing you can't be taught and it's not mentioned anywhere else. And that's that's a problem. Yeah, it definitely is a problem. It's actually working against itself. So I'm, I'm with you on that completely. Yeah. Integration is the key. OK, so you say mm -hmm. it's time that we recognize the historical roots of disability rights movement and how mental and emotional health are firmly in the center of that movement. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, when we think about this on multiple levels, right? So individuals, pull back for a second. You and I understand this, but I just wanna paint this picture for a second. So let's say someone is a sole provider for an elder and two children in their household, and they start going through severe depression, anxiety, perhaps they're feeling a bit paranoid, they're not eating or sleeping enough. And now, as we know very well, we start seeing a variety of mental health issues and symptomology, right? How do they get treatment? Who pays for treatment? Do they have time off of work? Is this considered a health issue? or mental health issue, or is it separated as like mental health, that's your issue? Or is this part of the root of disability awareness and justice, which is, this is a health issue. This can be seen as a disability because if I'm not able to care for my family, if I'm not able to work, if I'm not able to be here now, who is going to take care of me? Who's going to take care of this? Who's going to take care of my family? So it completely and utterly um, is related to who is able, right? And who is not. And there's a lot of oppression and discrimination around mental health issues still, right? And there's still not a lot of compassion and understanding. We say we want to be conscious of mental health, but still, mental health first aid, especially one with a cultural or decolonial lens or radical lens is not really honored and held. So most schools and places of business and nonprofits don't, don't, don't know what to do when someone needs mental health leave or when someone is saying, you know, I, I, I feel like someone's following me. I'm not sure what to do. Last week they were just fine, right? There, there's no support there's no leave um generally speaking sometimes there are right oftentimes people don't know how to navigate it we don't know where to send them and so this is a disability rights issue and that we need to make sure that there is not just freedom and capacity but healthy steps to support this person as they get the help they need and to make sure that they're fiscally and financially taken care of yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, what is reclaiming our past, future, and power through the decolonization of mental health mean? Mm -hmm. Great question. Well, reclaiming the past and that, as I was mentioning before, we have a variety of mostly European white male gay spaces and theories, right? That we are, we are told to know inside and out in jest. We need to know them like we know Lincoln and Washington and preamble. Okay, why do I know that to this day? I can recite it. Why? Why? <laughs> Listen, so we have that. And so part, I think, of the reclamation of the past is also honoring that, hey, you know, mindfulness practices were here and rooted long before psychology was. 
Well, who, who, what people was that in? Whose people was that in? Right? Plant medicines, psychedelics. Hmm, can we talk about these tribes in Peru, in Brazil, our North American First Nations people? Right? Are we giving them, A, are we letting them out of prison? for any times that they were incarcerated for their own medicines or their own beliefs or practices? B, are we compensating them either with land, money, right, deeds? I don't know, you know? Are we compensating them when so many of their original practices were co-opted, extracted, and used, right? Down to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, okay? And, mil and so many others, so many others. And then also so many examples. And also see, um, are we going to start to allow with the right process and credentialing helpers, healers, therapists, space holders to start really mixing and utilizing some of the community resources that are using and experts in ancestral practices for a particular community, right? So if I'm working like when in Jersey City, we had a high Haitian population, high student Haitian population. A lot of our students, some of them were, were Catholic and Christian, but majority of them, their religion was hoodoo, was voodoo, right? And so I asked, I was like, can we get a grant? Can we get some money to bring in one or two practitioners to give us an in-service, to teach us a little bit about how some of this is not paranoid. I already knew that. I knew that, but like I got colleagues and certain people I'm supervising, you know, and we, can we also put money into the community and into them by also bringing them in when appropriate to like with permission, right. To work with a student, right. I could be there. I could not be there depending on what the student wants or maybe run a student group. For students living with understanding, like, you know, they're Haitian and their they're, um, they're family practices who do, and maybe they're struggling with talking about it. Or they're struggling with things they've seen growing up. There's so much there. So much there. We're struggling with trauma related to A, B, C, and D. And so I feel like that's where the present comes in with the culture, where the past and the present merge, because there is a little bit of an ego that happens with practitioners, maybe not us, <laughs> we need to know everything. Like we need to have it on lock or I'm just going to read a book and know about this. We don't have lived experience. We shouldn't have lived experience and everything. Right. And so how do we involve community and whether that's Coptic Christian Egyptian church, if that's your, your people, whether it's Baptist Christian, whether it's people practicing Santeria, right? Like how are we bringing in culture, identity, community, to make sure that our people start to feel in their body the experience of safety. And I would say the last quick thing in terms of the future of this decolonial work is that this work is sort of an accompaniment to like land decolonization, right? But I think it's important for therapists and healers to understand what decolonization truly is right? How there's an, a psychological undoing process, an unlearning process that has to happen generationally for us to unlearn that shit. And, and <laughs> don't get me started. And, and that it is essential that we begin to think about our bodies also as land, right? Like, like, like our body, we are part of land, and so this undoing or decolonial process also is a recapitulating, rebringing in balance our relationship, particularly bodies of culture, right? Especially indigenous bodies, people indigenous everywhere across the globe, right? Whether you're in uh, South America, whether you're in Sierra Leone, right? The people indigenous there should be having more say when it comes to climate change, climate justice, what we're doing with spaces in the land. And so that's what I'm talking about. That's like a little snapshot when we're talking about past, present, future. Right now we need therapy as it is because people are in pain. We know that. We can't just cut, amputate the arm. However, however, it needs to change. There is a flesh colored band-aid, you know what I mean, on a very 
very kind of outdated way of doing healing. I, I think you and I are not interested in treatment. We're interested yeah. in liberation and healing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I feel you. I, that was well said. And thank you so much for putting it together and then eat the, buy the book to hear the rest. So um, <laughs> that, that was just enough to let him know what you're working <laughs> with. Uh, okay. So, so this brings me to a, a poignant question that's often uh, a challenge for many clinicians. So on this decolonization of therapy journey of ours, do you think clinicians should serve people outside of their own culture or are there cultural limitations? There's cultural limitations. Just because, I mean, I want to just keep it 100 here, right? Um, and, and, yeah, you know, and um, there are massive cultural limitations. Um, I think that some of the exceptions are when, and this happens often, and we know this, when there are entirely, uh, let's just say hypothetically, let's say you have whole centers, mental health facilities that are only of one particular culture or race, and they're serving, maybe, hopefully, <laughs> serving, they're treating, they're working with community, yep communities, individuals of majority, an entirely different culture or race or many other differences in races. And so when we're dealing with no, no support at all, or, okay, give me your CBT. Not, not, that there, not that there isn't some goodness in like cognitive distortions. I've used it myself with students, especially when they're just starting out, right? And they're like overthinking it. There's, a, there's something good about looking at them cognitive distortions, okay? But, and, <laughs> like, sometimes it's like, this is what we're working with. Especially I see this also in rural communities. Um, I've worked sometimes in Puerto Rico. I've worked in some consulting in, in Cayman Islands and Jamaica, where you're de basically dealing with predominantly white expat. Interesting that they're called expats, right? That's a whole other, don't get me started. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm being shady. I'm being shady. Uh, hey, Virgo. But it's like you're dealing with predominantly white providers in certain centers with a few like interns or one or two therapists of that community or of that culture. And then you have a wait list of individuals that are seeking services. So it's like, yes, all of them want to see somebody that is in some way reflective of them. Not all, but many. Um, but in that case, I would say, Yes, you, you need the support that you need at this time and they need to do better. We need to hire on, there are tons of people of culture or of cultures that are of that community that want to be therapists, that want to be paid, or that, as I said before, maybe don't need to be therapists, but they could be peer consultants and should be paid for their consultantship. You know? But I do think that there are major blocks I do think that if that person is not looking at their points of privilege that is treating or helping or supporting, if they're not actively involved in a group that is going to call them in and ask them to look at their points and, and their points of, uh, I'm trying to look for another word. I don't like blindness and using it in that way, but what they're not seeing, you know, um, I think that it's really important. Choose not to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and once again, we're asking those that are no longer of the global majority. <laughs> we're asking those that are um, many, maybe not all, but many that feel like they're losing their grip on power in some way, shape, or form to continue to concede and, and let go of power. And my, my response to that is, how's that going to go down? Right? How's that going? And maybe this is why we're seeing a rise and mental illness, mental health issues. This is why we're seeing a rise in violence and in white rage as well. We don't wanna talk about white rage, but that shit is there. Look at the insurrection. Absolutely. Right? right? Absolutely. Yeah, again, we could do two more shows on, on what we're doing right now. And, uh, and I wanna stay focused on the book uh, so that we can get as many people interested in knowing about what you're putting out there because it's important for everybody um, access to it. It's very important. As we wind down, you're the rage doctor. So say something about rage that people don't know. 
Me and Rage have a love affair. That's my boo. Okay. <laughs> I told my partner, I'm like, we started dating. I was like, um, just so you know, because uh, I don't, I don't want to publicize my, you know, I'm like, they call me the rage doctor. They're like, oh, that's so, that's amazing. I love that about you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, we're like a duo. <laughs> but what I will say is I think I am on a mission. Again, my students gave me this title because I was working with a lot of the students at the university that others would say um, were undesirable or defiant, air quotes if you can't see me, um, or manipulative. I like to say resourceful, okay? I was resourceful. I was resourceful as a youth. Um, we, we, we need to do what we need to do. But um, yeah, they gave me that title because I was working with a lot of these individuals and I right off the bat was like, this is not anger management. We're not talking about anger management. We're talking about what you're all talking about is a deeper rage that is not just about this incident. It's about all these places, spaces, and situations where your freedom was blocked, where your right to speak might have been blocked. Maybe your airways were blocked by law enforcement, by teacher, you know, literally or figuratively. Um, and so rage, I believe, is the love child of ancestral trauma and all different types of trauma, shame, and the kind of grief we're not allowed to talk about, that disenfranchised, suffocated grief, as Dr. Porsche, Dr. Torchell, Dr. Tasha Borchell talks about, as well as Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart, um, this kind of soul wound grief. And so I believe that rage can be dangerous when we don't start to form a relationship with it, when we don't start to look at it, deal with it, uh, understand that it's trying to protect us, trying to provide boundaries. Some of us are, are on this people-pleasing fawning tip, right? <laughs> because it's survival, right? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yes. Like, I'm not going to make eye contact. Where does that come from? Right? My grandfather would say, these type of people, you look down. You, you, you make sure you, you... Yeah, right? Depending on where you are. <laughs> You, yes, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> he's like, you're going to get killed one day. <laughs> and so, you know, yeah, I think that it's also important for all people, but youth, adolescents, and they're my favorite to work with around rage. But I think it's important that they understand that they're, that they, yeah, the facts that we tell many of our loved ones, like you can get killed for coming out of pocket. You know, depending on who you are, how you sound like, where, where, you, where you're dressed like that day, right? You could be doctor, whatever, but get you a fitted hat and, you know, and a different fit. Like, it, it's on. And not, and not even. What about the Harvard professor was going in his house and the That's cops right. came and round him up? So you don't even have to be dressed That's a certain right. way. That's the color of your skin. Which brings me to the final point before I end with one of your quotes, which is, you know, we can't, we have to acknowledge the colorism within this rage that we want to embrace, right? Because there are certain people who, who can have rage, it's an excuse, and others who cannot. And I think that's important to, to be clear. You're not talking about rage nilly, willy nilly. You're talking about the fact that, so, you know, we need to get in touch with our rage and manage it effectively, but we are not going to not acknowledge that there are people who are rageful all the time and they can be and have access to it frequently and that it's that's not okay we're not talking about the no. same thing right no um i like to really talk about rage that i feel is sacred meaning rage that is righteous and rage that is for bodies of culture like letting us know that these big feelings don't need to be pathologized that they don't need to be contained like every time especially black bodies have revolted have risen up have spoken out look at the civil rights ever look at the black panthers look at brown berets look at we can keep going on we can see them systemically and structurally taken out right and saying that they're an enemy of the state right they're an enemy of the state they're a terrorist and the language that we use for who and what bodies, particularly darker, bigger, disabled bodies, right? And so I don't even think it's, it's a question, and I've said this before, that I'm allowed to talk about rage because I live with a lot of light skin privilege. Ton of it. Ton of it. 
I want, I want, I want to challenge. I want to push back a little bit on the use of the word privilege. Yes. There's, there's nothing that you bring to the table that is privilege. Thank you. Thank might you. be earned, and you might have some access, which you have figured out in academia how to create. But there is none of us walking around in body, cultures, uh, bodies of culture that is privilege. I think we Thank have to draw a line. Thank yes. It gets homogenized. Yeah. And we all got a little, no, 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 yes. no, no. Facts. So I just want to, I want to push back. Thank on you. One. Thank you. <laughs> I like yeah. that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm going to end with a quote of yours and then you're going to tell everybody where to find you, your book, all of that good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So another quote of yours is, it is important for us to try to build new ways of coping in our bodies and our systems in ways that help us ground ourselves. Can you lead us out with that? Mm. I would like, if I may, can I ask everyone to take a breath? Can I? I would like to invite us to take a breath. And if you, we wouldn't mind to either look down or close your eyes just for 30 seconds, 30 seconds, just humor me and place your hands somewhere that feels safe enough and good enough on your body, whether it's your heart, your throat. And breathe in from the bottom of your feet. And just release in a way that feels good to you. Let's do that one more time. Loosening our jaw. Loosening our shoulders. And I'm going to say something. Keep looking down or leaving your eyes closed. Let's breathe in an image of liberation in our lives. Breathe in an image of liberation in your life. Let's breathe out the noose of white-bodied supremacy around our hearts and wrists and throats. Let's breathe in community and accompliceship and allyship. Let's breathe out feeling like an imposter or a fake or not good enough because you fucking are. One more time and let's breathe in knowing that we are the hope and the reason people that came before us endured so much. And let's breathe out people pleasing, fawning, trying to be quote unquote good little ones. We don't have time for that. And our youth are dying. We don't have space for that. And just shake it out if you can with your hands or your arms, anything you don't need right now. Shake out your shoulders, shake out your hands if that feels good to you. And say out loud, I'm a badass and I'm here to decolonize some shit. <laughs> absolutely thank you and i just want to push back on one other thing we have to stop giving white bodies that allyship because it is not active let's start requesting some abolition yes, yes. That allyship gift is gone you gotta yes. put some work what are you behind willing to give up right what are you willing to give up for us and our freedom, if you say you care, are you about it? Yes. 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 And yes. for themselves, because they're yes. suffering too. You know, we have our own version, but they have yes. theirs too. Time to yes. acknowledge that yes. and put it to use. Yes. All right, Dr. Now, this has been a pleasure. Please tell everybody where they can find you, yeah. find your book, social yeah. media handles, yeah, all you that. You can find me best on Instagram at Decolonizing Therapy. I'm also on LinkedIn under Dr. Jennifer Mullen. Um, you can locate me. There's so many channels, right? There's so many on Facebook as well under Decolonizing Therapy and our website. We try to make it so super easy for you, decolonizingtherapy.com, where we have an array of webinars, courses, a politicizing your practice series for nonprofits and organizations seeking to start some of these steps. Um, and the book can be found in most places across the U.S., Canada, um, even our motherland continent, um, whether you find one of your little bookstores, Amazon or Norton.com. Um, continue to please support as well. So often um, black writers and authors, particularly around topics such as these, are pushed to the side, are not provided with the kind of support that's needed in publishing, and our publishing process is pretty grueling, and we're not receiving the same um, 
let's say honorarium <laughs> as others. So any support that you provide by the book for someone else, even if you don't think it's your jam or you've already bought one, it would be um, much appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. I'm absolutely buying the book. You can count on that thank and you. telling others about it. And um, I just want to thank you so much for making time to share space and talk about decolonization of our clinical work through your lens and your experience, I think it's incredibly important. This revolution needs to continue to grow on all of our behalf. So thank you so much for your work and doing the uh, progression of the movement forward to change the narrative. Thank, thank you, you so again. much for having me. It is a pleasure. Thank you.